This is the Stanford's Travel Writers Festival. Please welcome David Hempelman Adams in conversation with Paul Blazard. Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to this rather special event for the Edward Stanford's Travel Writers Festival 2021. The uh, the festival that I keep just uh, keep calling the special limited digital edition uh, because, for reasons obvious to all of us, Olympia won't let us through their doorway, and quite right too. So this is a way of bringing you travel, armchair travellers of the world unite through the internet, and boy, do we have an explorer, adventurer, and industrialist to talk to you today. So David Kim Hempelman Adams, KCVO, OBE, K St. J, DL, is a British industrialist and adventurer. He's the first person in history to have reached the geographic and magnetic North and South Poles, as well as to climb the highest peaks in all seven continents, the Adventurer's Grand Slam. Born in Swindon in 1956, on what happens to be my birthday as well, the 10th of October, his interest in adventuring was inspired by the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, of which he is a gold medalist. A businessman by profession, but an adventurer by preference, along with the Polar o Ocean Challenge, he's also founded the charity Wicked Weather, aimed at bringing issues of global warming to younger people and schools. At the risk of not sparing his blushes, I'd like you to know this about Sir David. In 2013, he was awarded the Polar Medal and bar by Her Majesty the Queen for services to the UK in the field of polar research. He received the MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours of 1995 and subsequently the OBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours for 1998 for services to Arctic exploration. He was appointed Lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order, the LBO, in 2007 New Year's Honours and Knight Commander of the Royal Victorian Order, KCVO, in the 2017 New Year's Honours, both in recognition of his service to the Duke of Edinburgh Award Schemes. He's also been made a Knight of Justice of the Order of St John's. He holds the Gold Medal of the Royal Aero Club. He was awarded the Explorers Medal by the Explorers Club at their centennial dinner, and he became a Freeman of the City of London in 2008. All of which would lead you to believe that he was and is and always has been uh, a high-flying member of the British establishment. I am delighted to learn, Sir David Hempelman Adams, that's not the case. A very warm welcome to this festival. Can you tell us about the early days of David Hempelman Adams, please? Early days? Well, as he said, quite rightly said, uh, I was born in Swindon, which I'm very proud of. A lot of people say Swindon, oh my goodness, but... Um, it's a wonderful uh, town surrounded by beautiful countryside. Uh, my father, my grandfather was um, an industrialist. He had a big engineering company. Uh, my father, uh, the same. Uh, and basically we were into uh, glue, as, as Sue Lawley once said, posh glue. We, don't, we, never, we never boiled down donkeys or anything. <laughs> So that's been... Uh, adhesives, dear boy, adhesives. That's it. So that's always been the family um, uh, business. Uh, I, my parents uh, divorced when I was very young. I was uh, David Kim Hempelman. Uh, I was brought up by my stepfather, who changed my name to Adams when I was about 10. So I went through school uh, as an Adams. And then when I was old enough, I thought, well, actually... Uh, I didn't want to disrespect him, but I wanted my name back. So that's where the Hempel and Adams comes from. So, um, as you quite rightly said, um, I started through the Duke of Edinburgh's Award, uh, bronze uh, to start with, then silver, then gold. And I've often said that was actually the hardest expeditions I've ever done in my life, because if someone phoned me up tomorrow, I could probably pack and get ready for Everest or a polar trip or a sailing trip. Um, back when you're 13 and you've never been uh, out of your county, you've never been in a tent, never shared a tent, never cooked, never been on the side of a mountain. It was scary. And I remember it very, very vividly to this day. So that was my start of uh, adventuring. I, I just loved it. Um, and then I went off to university, did business studies, and, and uh, went on to do postgrad work. Uh, meanwhile, traveling the world, climbing, all climbing then, no polar. Uh, and at one stage, I thought I'd like to become um, a mountain guide. And in retrospect, probably I wasn't good enough, even though I thought I was. But I, I always thought, actually, 
uh, if you do it as a living, then it becomes a job. And whilst there's lots of other adventurers around the world making a great living out of it, uh, and fantastic, that's not, that's not uh, anything against that. But I just felt um, I, I wanted to get my teeth into uh, business because I've been brought up with that, with the family, and sort of go off when I could uh, in my holidays or spare time uh, on adventures. And as I sort of slowly floated to the top of some pretty nice stuff, which I did, uh, I found um, I sort of floated to the top of the corporate ladder uh, and it was becoming increasingly harder to go away. Um, and then I had a family, so that was uh, becoming more and more difficult to get away. And the bigger trips, you know, the bigger North Pole trips or the Everest trips are, you know, they take a long time. So it's always been that sort of juggling of uh, balls, um, charity, family, business, and adventure. David, thank you. That's a good synopsis. We're going to unpack some of that, and I'm going to backtrack you a little bit, if I may. I really enjoyed reading one of the books that we're here to talk about, No Such Thing as Failure. You write very tenderly about your stepfather and very passionately, which was I found incredibly heartwarming. But can we go back to your original, one of your original start points? And I've always very fascinated by the hinge points in people's lives and the people that makes those make those hinge points a possibility and in your case it strikes me from the early early parts of, of this book there was a man called mr james jesse james he was known as who played a key role in the david hempelman adams we see before us today would you tell us who he was and why well when my parents uh, divorced i was you know roughly about 10 so i was going on to the senior school then and so my uh, mother remarried and uh, I moved to uh, a place called Rithlington, which, is, it, which was near the Somerset Coalfields. And, um, and, you know, in those days, it was out in the countryside. It was a comprehensive. And out of probably 600 children, um, my family were probably the only um, divorcees. And actually, nobody knew that my parents were divorced. Um, Jesse James was the PE teacher, Mansell James, and he was, he was a huge influence on me. And I think he knew probably that my parents had split up. And he really did take me under his uh, wing and got me involved with the DOV and was very, very influential all my life. And I remember, um, you know, I was very fit in those days, of course. I remember um, doing the bronze award and on this bronze award, we had to get to this checkpoint. And I, I love this man. I you know, look, really looked up to him. So we were going to miss the time of this checkpoint. It was five of us. And I said to the boys, right, I'm going to go on. I'll get into the checkpoint for all of us. And then we'll all be OK. So that was agreed. So off I went, charging the head, got to this hairpin. And he was there waiting for me. And he said, well, where's the rest of the group? And I said, well, they're behind, you know, they're coming on checking in. And he was furious. And he said, you know, always bring back your dead. And, you know, obviously at that age, I didn't know what on earth he was saying. And um, he said, listen, you just got, it's a team. You've got to be part of a team. And none of this solo stuff going off, you know, it's dangerous stuff. And that's, that's actually been a very good lesson on several occasions in my life in the bigger mountains. And I, again, I remember he said to me, right, uh, choose who you want and we're gonna have a race across the mountain. You think you're so clever, find someone. So we went off and we got to the top of this mountain and he said, right, we're gonna race back down to the, the car. And, uh, and he said, and if you overtake me, I'm gonna give you a good old slipper. So I said, well, how do I win then? And he said, well, that's the point. You're not going to. You're going to be behind me, and we're going to go at my pace. And that was a very, very good lesson. And it's been a good lesson on several occasions, as I said. Uh, there was, I was on another DOV uh, trek, probably my silver, and it was snowing. And two of the guys came down with hypothermia. And I thought, right, I'm going to go off and get help. And there was this little niggling, niggling thing. And I thought, no, I can't go off by myself. So I took three of the others, left these two guys in the tent, 
And three of us, instead of me, three of us went down and um, we got them. The teachers got these two guys from the tent. And I was probably obviously 14 then. And I remember he was a great Welshman and he took me into the pub and he bought me a shandy and he said, well done. And that actually was probably worth any knighthood or polar medal. So when, uh, when in 1993, I actually uh, achieved uh, the summit of Everest, on the top there were uh, lots of souvenirs at the top. Uh, I put a Mars bar to thank the gods for getting me up safely. And I took down a couple of ice screws that were on the summit. And as soon as I got home, I went round to uh, Jesse James and gave him this ice screw and said, thank you very much. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna get you to tell that story once we covered Everest. But what was his response, by the way? It's a lovely part. It's a lovely thing to have done. Well, it's one of those things, you know. When you leave school, you, you know, it's a great chapter of your life. I'm very fortunate. I'm still in touch with a lot of my friends from all those years ago. But he was the only teacher I actually kept in touch with, and and unfortunately, what during the sail around the uh, the Polar Ocean Challenge, he died. And very unfortunately, I couldn't go to uh, the funeral. So we stayed in touch, you know, all, you know, all his life. Lovely to hear. Before we move on to a big rock, can you talk us through, there is, in the early parts of the, of the book, Don't Know Such Thing as Fame, there's a lovely little episode from Vice Hall, which we'll let people read. But can you tell us about what took you to Alaska and what you learned from that? Alaska. So, um... Well, we, we um, there was myself and a guy called Steve Vincent. We were doing sort of a student exchange, uh, teaching climbing you know, out in the States. So the first time I went to the States, I was 17. And after the camp, we used to uh, go off climbing. Um, and then this particular year, we decided to go and climb uh, Mount McKinley. So we were very young boys. And we hitchhiked all the way from New York all the way up to uh, McKinley. And we got this wheeze that uh, if we had a Union Jack and stand on the uh, hard shoulder, people would give us a lift. And that's exactly what happened. People would see this Union Jack and put on their brakes and come from the third lane all the way over just to give us a lift. So we got all the way up to Alaska. And then uh, we um, climbed, we did a little bit of uh, acclimatization and a bit of climbing around. And then we were flown in onto uh, Mount McKinley, Denali these days. And it was, it was, you know, quite, you know, looking back now, foolish because we uh, got altitude sickness, we were trying it too fast. Um, but there was no one else on the mountain. It was, it was fantastic. So this was one of the uh, you know, one of the seven summits, but of course in those days there was no such thing as the seven summits. No, you know this thing that Pat Morrow start, started. So I was not ahead of my time. It was just one of the seven summits, but it was also you know we were the only it was a couple of Japanese guys uh, on the mountain as well, and uh, we 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 got back down. I remember. We, uh, we hitched like all the way back down as well to California and we got this picked up by this uh, old couple, old in inverted commas because I'm older than them <laughs> now, uh, in a huge uh, Winnebago. So we, off we went and it, it's, it's not tarmac, it's just very hard um, shingle and within probably 20 minutes we got a puncture. So this old fellow, you know, got the got down, got his wheel out, and it probably took three hours to get him to change his tire. And I said, you know, look, we're we'll help next time. We'll we'll try and do it. So we went on. Probably two hours later, there was another puncture. So myself and Steve, we jumped out and said, right, you do this, you do that, and we we changed it. Probably an hour. Anyway, we went on another probably four hours, another puncture. Meanwhile, we worked out, we were trying to reduce this time because we thought we're never gonna get off this Alaska Highway. So um, we were looking forward to the next puncture. So the next puncture, he put his handbrake on, we said to the guy and his wife, you just stay inside 
and we ran out one of us and we got it really uh, down to a T. And in the end, I think we got it down to about 15 minutes. So we would have been really good on any Formula One <laughs> team <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> so we got to a place called uh, Whitehorse. And by this time, we'd had enough of changing tyres. And uh, we said, right, we're going to get the Greyhound bus. So uh, we left uh, this couple. Luckily, it was tarmac now, so they were okay. But uh, they, they made us a very, very nice thank you dinner, which was nice. Climbing across America, starting with McKinley, and you did some other peaks as well, I know. Led, let's come now to, to, to one of the main events. Um, the events of the, that led to the 9th of October, 1993 at 11:38 a.m which you nearly didn't which nearly didn't happen but for the fact you took the advantage of inviting somebody to lunch in bath if memory serves which is what triggered it all otherwise it might not have happened tell us about how your first everest attempt came to be well um uh, you're racking my brains now so um the <laughs> Uh, there was a guy called Steve Bell, um, and he was leading a team. I was at work, and uh, the, the opportunity came up to actually uh, climb Everest. And the reason why it was difficult, one, you know, I was, uh, I think I was the MD then uh, of a, you know, it was a pretty big company, international company. And I wasn't sure if I could get the time. Uh, I had two young girls, and... Um, it was also, when you look at Everest, it was post-monsoon time. So that was the colder time of the, of the year. So eventually, um, I managed to persuade Steve to, um, let me get on the trip and off we went to, you know, um, the Himalayas, Kathmandu. I mean, in those days, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting how time has moved on so fast that uh, you would write a letter and you give it to um, a male boy and he would run back and then the plane from Lukla would get it back to Kathmandu. But in fact, uh, most of my letters, I actually, <laughs> I beat my letters back. Um, so it was a pretty slow process. Whereas they, they you know, these days, of course, um, you can take a photograph and instantly put it on a, an iPhone and it's around the world. And in those days, when we climbed it, in, interestingly, post monsoon, I think there was 10 of us. Uh, there was just three expeditions, small expeditions, a French uh, team, Spanish and ourselves. And so I think in total, there was only about 10 who actually climbed to the summit, which was you know, very, very different to these days. Interestingly enough, just as a digression, just last week, I was with uh, a friend, and he was one of the French guys, actually, on the French team. And if I just roll back about 15 years ago, we were uh, both invited on this trip down to Antarctica, and we were in this hotel, you know, about 20 of us having beers. And uh, someone said, you know, um, this Ben, he'd been on Everest. And I said, oh, yeah, what year is that then? And he's still oh, 93. And I said, Hmm. I was on there at 93 and he and uh, he said well I was on post monsoon I said well that's funny I was post monsoon and actual fact we were both on the same mountain at the same time so it's a small world sometimes very small can I ask you you've achieved so much in terms of exploring and adventuring but first they're always notable obviously your first summit, what did that What did that mean to you, given the inspiration that had led you to get there and the practice and the peaks that you climbed and so on and so forth? The actual first summit of Everest, see, it, it, it's meaningful. You write very beautifully and elegiacly about the history, the spirituality of the mountain, what the Nepalese think of it, how they perceive it, the view from the north, the view from the south, all that sort of stuff. But for those of us that haven't and probably never will have the luxury of standing on that summit, can you talk us through what that actually means to you, David? Well, I think, um, as I said, I'm a, a part-time adventurer. So um, you get these ideas and then hopefully um, you can do them. And of course, as a young boy, when you're at school, you read National Geographic. I read Hunt's book when he had climbed and 
uh, Hillary's book. And so um, there's always that history, that real deep history. And I also remember at school when I was in the sixth form going off to see uh, Chris Bonington's Southwest Face uh, Everest expedition. And of course, uh, and when I was a young boy, I wrote to him and said, if you go into Everest again, can I come along <laughs> as your porter? And it was a very good lesson, actually, because, you know, I've, I've met him lots of times since, but he was extremely kind. He, he, he had the good grace to write back to me and say, listen, you're too young at the moment. Keep doing what you're doing. And who knows, you know, um, you, you might get there yourself. And um, I remember just all those names, Kathmandu, for example, and all the places in Kathmandu, they all came alive in the, in the trek in to these wonderful little villages, Namchi Bazaar, of course. Um, and all these names are sort of imprinted in your memory. And then the first time you actually see Everest from the Tangbochi Monastery, and that walk in was really, really special. And actually for me, it was the whole entire experience, not, not really uh, going to climb it. And of course, um, as you get higher, I think if you can keep your body together, uh, that's the important thing. And I, I was struggling. I, I broke a couple of ribs from coughing and I thought, well, you know, that's, that's the end for me. But what I'm going to keep doing is keep going up uh, and then keep going until uh, the tank's empty and, and go as far as you can. So, of course, um, I was on the same um, trip as Brian Blessed. And Brian was always great for morale. And even though I was pretty low with these broken ribs uh, and coughing, you know, like a, a seal, uh, you know, I, I'd never thought, you know, you would, I would get up. And he was, you know, he was always very encouraging, you know, MP, you know, and I had my head over a, a steaming bowl and he would come in and do his rah, rah, rah. And uh, he was wonderful, absolutely fantastic for morale. And, um, you know, when the day came to actually start off, uh, I left a, a letter for home just in case I didn't get back. And I just thought, you know, let's see how far we can go. And I was very lucky. I got through to Camp 1, Camp 2, um, and then went up to Camp 3. And it was all new. It was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So uh, on the morning of the climb at the South Coal, you just... Uh, think, well, let's, let's, this is a one-off chance. And as you get higher and higher, you, you, I, I remember turning around when the sun started to rise above the horizon. And there was a couple, there was Lhotse still towering above me. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've got a long way to go yet. And you keep plodding on, plodding on. And um, we had a, a big avalanche and so it took out all our oxygen. So we had very, very, very limited oxygen. I think we were probably only on one or two liters per minute, which is very, very low. And um, I was with a, a Sherpa called Natemba, who was the, the lead Sherpa. Um, and we we just plodded on and we got to the, uh, what's called the balcony where um, Ed Hillary and Tensing had camped. And I just thought then, I thought, my goodness, this is pretty exposed. You know, imagine doing this for the first time and then get into the South Coal and all the history, of course, behind that with uh, Doug Scott and um, Dougal Huston doing a bivouac there. And then, um, you know, there was no fixed ropes or anything that you get these days. You just keep on climbing. Then the Hillary step. And I thought again, you know, imagine doing this for the first time, the psychological uh, challenge of that and climbing up there and then uh, plodding to the top and it was very very special I remember thinking you know I'm never going to be here again do a 360 degrees and see around the world uh, I, I, I put down a dug a little hole and put a Mars bar in to thank the gods and uh, picked up a couple of ice cream. Uh, you say Twix. <laughs> Sorry, David, you say Twix in the book. There you go. You caught me out. <laughs> it was a chocolate bar of some, <laughs> some sort. <laughs> of some description. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then I just thought, my goodness, you know, I've got to get back down because most people die going back down. 
and uh and, and you know there was i didn't have any water no food going up it was uh, pretty out there actually and, and you know, as i said there was no crowds we were the only people there getting back down to the south coal and um you know we were i you know i was incredibly lucky and i felt slightly disappointed that i'd done it because this was all my heroes had climbed this and you read it um, and then suddenly, you know, you climb this and I, I was slightly disappointed that I'd actually achieved it. So, but also I felt extremely privileged that uh, I'd had the chance to do it and then, you know, get down safely. When you say disappointed, you mean in the, sort of the Alexander the Great, you know, sort of sense, you realised there were, there were no more lands yet, yet to conquer. What, what do you mean by disappointment? Well, I think in terms of mountaineering, for me, um, you know, as a, from a 13-year-old, I've been climbing. And that's obviously the pinnacle of anybody's uh, dreams. And again, you know, when you do a lot of reading or background reading, you, you hear of people dying, of course, and people having the third man syndrome, people uh, uh, really struggling. And... Uh, Compared to the North and the South Pole and other things, Everest is hard, you know, unquestionably it's hard. You, you've got to be lucky. Uh, and, and I was extremely lucky. But um, odd, oddly enough, the North side, uh, again, you've got it's steeped in history and it's, it's wonderful. Um, and I, I always thought there's, a, a, there's, a, there's different steps on the North side. It's more technical. And of course, if uh, Mallory and Irvin had climbed it first, then you know they, they would have been the first. But did they climb that step uh, without the ladder there, the Chinese ladder? Mm -hmm. I have to say, it's pretty difficult, even though you've got a ladder there. <laughs> so, and, and and some, you know, there's a couple of Americans who've climbed it without the, the you know, the, yeah. the ladder. So, you know, the, the romance of me or the romantic side of me would love the fact that they had done it first. Um, a lot of people will say, you know, it was impossible and all the rest of it, but I still like to think that they, they did it. Until we find the camera, we're never going to know, are we? That's the sadness of it, but also part of the mystique. Absolutely. Can we come now, the, your, your book, No Such Thing as Fair, is divided into three sections, rock, ice and wind or air rather can we do with ice because of course you have been repeatedly drawn to both poles it's a bit of a dumbass question i sort of apologize for framing it in this way but what is it what is that attraction not necessarily magnetic about the north pole for you what has drawn you back there i think it's partly with with everest and the big mountains you are there's a lot of people there normally, you know, it's pretty slow going. Um, it is obviously very beautiful the higher you get up and, and all those things of, of going to the summit. But I found with the poles, north and the south pole, um, it's always beautifully pristine. The, it's every single day is different because of the temperature or the weather. Uh, and it, it has, it's, it is magnetic for me. I, I love going back. And I haven't got a favourite, you know, the north and the south are, you know, very, very different, but I haven't got a favourite. And um, they are beautiful places. I, I really love going back each time. Looking back on 84, I mean, I remember you doing it, and I just remember jumping for joy when I'd heard that you made it. Solo, no dogs, no snowmobiles or air supplies. I mean, that's a hell of a human challenge. I can't quite believe, you know, the boy that I was then in 84 is, is talking to the man that I read about then. Can you just talk us through just how much of a physical challenge that was? Well, the, um, the back the story of that is um, Everest had been climbed, Everest had been climbed um, by different uh, routes. And um, Mesner and Heibler, went and climbed it um, without oxygen. And there was a lot of poo-pooing at the time while well, he couldn't have done it and Sherpas saw him with oxygen. And a lot of uh, people came out and said, 
um, they, there's no way you could do it. The physiology, you couldn't do it. So it was poo-pooed at the time. And Mesno, in a wonderful up yours moment, went to the north side, didn't tell many people, just went there on with his girlfriend and uh, climbed the north face uh, without oxygen solo on a new route and got to the summit and took some fantastic photographs. And I thought, my God, you know, that that was the pinnacle that for me, I would have loved to have done that. Um, and at that time, uh, in terms of polar exploration, certainly the North Pole, um, no one had been there, the North Pole, very, very few people, teams had been there without um, the use of dog teams or snowmobiles. No one had ever tried it with uh, small little sledges. And um, further than that, the limiting factor of dogs and snowmobiles, you've got to drop either dog food or fuel. So it's a, they're big, big teams, multi-million pound expeditions and government expeditions. No one had ever tried a Mesner on the North Pole. So I thought, well, I'll give this a go. 600 miles can't be that bad. <laughs> so uh, that's what I tried in 1983. And, um, and in those days, of course, there was no sat phones. There was no GPSs. I didn't have the experience. Uh, and I failed. I failed miserably. Uh, and it was, oh my goodness, it was, you know, uproar. Um, a lot of people said, well, I was foolish to, to you know, to try it. And um, it was, you know, insane to try it and all these other things. And when I sort of came back, having failed, people said, well, I told you so and, and all the rest of it. So um, I have to say, I did have my tail between my legs. And so I thought, well, actually, I learned a lot. And on every single one of my expeditions, whatever it is, I take a little blue um, book and put jottings in with all the things that I can improve on. And I must have had probably 200 <laughs> things I could have improved uh, the expedition on. So then I thought, right, what I'm going to do is not tell anyone, no media presence, nothing. And I'm going to try the uh, magnetic North Pole. So it was, uh, again, um, from memory, 300 miles or something like that. And I wanted to do it solo and um, uh, with, with no support. So off I went. And I got into trouble pretty quick, about five days in, I think it was, when I was, um, had a polar bear coming through the tent. And unfortunately, you know, I, I had to shoot it. Well, of course... Um, that, that, um, that, well, the media, um, of course, got onto that. And a lot of people said, quite rightly, you know, um, why shoot this cuddly beer? What right have I got to be there? Which, you know, is a fair, fair comment. Anyway, so the, 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 the news got out. And I carried on. And um, thankfully, you know, I, I managed to get to the, the magnetic North Pole. One day, I remember, <laughs> I'm not too sure if I've told anyone this, but um, what, you know, as I said, there was no GPSs in those days. The magnetic compass, you know, was obviously useless. Uh, but I was given this position by the Geomagnetic Survey of Canada and uh, the UK. So I had a specific lap long to get to. And this one particular, about three days before getting there, it was just a wide expanse and white out, complete white out. And so off I um, went in the morning and I thought, right, um, the way you, you, you use the sun as a navigation. Um, and, but of course, uh, the sun was um, shielded by all this thick cloud. So I thought, right, uh, I'm going to be very clever here. So I had a camera with a light meter. And I went around 360 and saw the biggest reflection in the light meter. And I thought, well, that's the sun. So this is the time of day. So that's the direction I'm going. So off I went. And I came across these tracks, ski tracks. And I thought, blimey, I thought I was the only one up here by myself. So I put the tent up. I had to put out this big uh, HF antenna contacted uh, my base and said, um, 
I've just come across these tracks. I can't be the only person here. And they said, well, are you sure it's tracks? I said, yeah, there's ski tracks and there's a sledge, it's sledge runners. And they said, well, look, we'll get back to you in an hour's time. So they checked up, they checked up the different uh, organizations up in Resolute Bay. And they said, no, you're the only one up there. And what had happened uh, over an eight hour period, I just did a big circle. <laughs> <laughs> and so my navigation <laughs> wasn't so clever, but uh, yeah, that was a good that was a good lesson. Easy to get lost. I mean, a hell of an achievement, a hell of an achievement. How did that differ from the? Um, you did an unsupported to the South Pole. I'm trying to remember what date it was. I can't see read my notes properly. You, what were the different? Well, the that was 95, 96. Thank you, David. Yes, of course you'd know. I should have just asked you, shouldn't I? What was the difference in that? How did those How did those two expeditions differ to your mind? Well, certainly the Arctic one um, is different terrain. You've got uh, polar bears. You've got thinner. I went through the ice, which was pretty scary. Um, but I was still a relative novice at that start. You know, eighty three. I was, you know, still a novice. Um, and again, going on after that, I went back, um, well, nearly every year up to the Arctic and getting more and more experience. And again, uh, improving on food, improving on fitness, improving on equipment um, and going with teams and not with teams. And so it's just this slow, gradual, pro there's not a silver bullet, there's a slow uh, progress, I suppose. And I think the South Pole was no, no Brit had ever done it solo or unsupported at that time. Um, and I thought, well, let's give this a go. I, th I felt I had enough experience at this time in the right gear to give it a shot. And uh, the only dangers down there is, is, is uh, crevasses. And, you know, you've got to watch those. Um, but at that time, there was a guy called Theodore Konikoff as well. And that, it was a very interesting year, 95, because there was Borg Orsland. We all met in Punta Arenas because then again, of course, very few people were doing these things. So this particular year, there was Borg Orsland who was trying to get to the South Pole. Um, myself trying to be uh, the first Brit. Fyodor Konikov, who was a Russian, trying to be the first Russian. There was two uh, Canadians, French Canadians. And uh, they were trying to be the first uh, guys there. So it was a really you know, great group. And, and it was good in we were racing against ourselves and for ourselves. But, uh, you know, Borger was, was very good, giving me um, different Norwegian foods and uh, different techniques. Uh, and, but Theodore, I had the best equipment I had. Uh, the best skis, Norwegian skis, lightweight tent, great sleeping bag, really good food, the whole lot of lightweight uh, and really, really good. Fyodor Konikov um, was this Russian priest who was a sailor and he turned out with these uh, rusty old skis. His food, he came to my bedroom with, as a, with a present of vodka and um, dried fish. And I thought, well, I'll, when he's gone, I'll get rid of the fish. But no, he wasn't having that. He pulled this fish apart and <laughs> he started eating it. So we started uh, from a place called Hercules Inlet, which is uh, 80 degrees south. And we were, I think, about 30 miles apart from our start points. And, you know, each night we would radio in and we, I'd figure out, you know, where each of us were. Um, and after 60 days, you know, I got to the South Pole. And with all this rubbish, he had absolute, oh, his gear was antique. He beat me. So <laughs> it was a very good uh, humbling lesson, you know, and he, cool, he's a hard man. And, um, and I'm, you know, an extraordinary man. But it was, it was great. And, you know, that's the great thing about uh, adventure and exploration you, you you make great friends for life and we're still good friends can we touch on ballooning david and we're going to touch on it this way in june 2005 you staged the world's highest formal dinner party with bear grills and alan veal 
what on earth possessed you? What was the point you were trying to make? And could, by way of telling, could you tell us what your introduction to ballooning was? And I'm sorry to have to ask you this, Sir David. We need a little bit of brevity, I'm afraid. Otherwise, we're going to miss out talking about the Polar Ocean Challenge, which I very much want to do. Well, I got into ballooning. It was quite simple. Um, by 1997, um, I was getting close to doing the Grand Slam. And at that time, there was no such thing. Uh, and that was climbing the highest mountains on each continent and getting to the north and south geographical poles. Uh, just for added uh, in, uh, enjoyment, I'd done the magnetic poles as well. And the only thing left in that jigsaw for me was the, the North Pole. Theodore actually had a couple other things to do. And there was a guy from Singapore who added a couple other things. But it became slightly of a race. So 97, off I went with a guy called Rune Geldness, uh, a Norwegian, and we were trying to get to uh, the North Pole, and we failed um, for lots of different reasons. And, and I thought, right, I've got to go back. And we learned a lot, and I would say there's no such thing as failure. And the reason I say that is um, if you know in your heart you can do it, you've got to go out and do it. If, if you, you know you can do it and you don't try, then you fail. And I often say that to my girls and I, and I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I didn't give it another go. Anyway, um, halfway there, it was uh, a complete whiteout again. It was cold, you know, down into sort of minus 40, minus 45. And we took eight hours pulling these 300 pound sledges. I would always do the navigation each night, get in the tent, do the cooking and that particular day uh, we'd made six miles progress which was pretty good um, and in the morning you would check your navigation just to see if you drift the pan of ice had drifted around and that particular day i checked in the morning and we drifted back during the night while we slept seven miles and that happened three days on the trot and i thought we're going to miss this again. You know, I've, I've tried and I'm going to miss this again. And at that particular time, um, a lot of uh, people were trying to fly around the world in a balloon. There was Branson, Steve Fawcett, there was the cable and wireless team, there was the Breitling team. Lots of people were trying to do it. And at that point, no one had ever uh, done it or achieved it. And at that point, um, I remember again as a boy, uh, reading about uh, this Swedish guy called Andre, and he tried to um, uh, balloon to the North Pole. So when I got back, I thought, hmm, this ballooning, that'd be much nicer than actually skiing <laughs> to the North Pole and easier. So at that time, then, uh, Brian Jones and Bertrand Picard had actually achieved it. So I, I phoned up Brian, who was, uh, in, in fact, you know, he he was very helpful in lots of ways and actually uh, one of the guys pilots who taught me to fly with terry mccoy so um then the meteorologists got hold of this and they said no you can't do it so to cut a long story short in 2000 i set off from spitsbergen as andre did uh, flew to within eight miles of the north pole in a balloon uh, and back again uh, six days in a balloon and of all the things I've ever done, um, I think that for me is my personally my greatest achievement because all the other things other people have done before, uh, the North Pole, South Pole, Everest, whereas this was, you know, really special. So um, I found I really loved ballooning. I loved the community of ballooning. I loved the people. I loved um, using my skills, cold weather skills in ballooning. And, uh, you know, going on from that, I did quite a few big trips with balloons. But um, I was in London and uh, I know Beer Grills and we were having a, a glass of wine on his uh, little barge on the Thames. And he said, MP, you know, uh, how about this for an idea? So it was his idea, all credit to him. And he said, rather than going up to base camp of Everest and having a black tie dinner and having the highest black tie dinner, how about if you flew a balloon and uh, a couple of us have a dinner underneath? Well, we started off, we were going to do it in the basket, but it was a, it, we needed a huge basket for that. So he said, okay, um, we'll do it underneath. 
And after I finished, you know, we'd jump off. And I said, well, what's the altitude? He said, oh, about um, 18,000, 19,000. So uh, it's not so easy in the UK. You get up to 20,000 feet and you know, you need a lot of permissions and all the rest of it. So we planned this, worked on this quite a lot. And um, so we organized this uh, table and little things of what they were going to eat, you know, because if you dropped a potato off of the table and that fell 20,000 feet, that's, that's going to kill someone. So all these little things had to be thought of and you don't want to go dropping a knife and a fork from 20,000 feet. And uh, we had to get uh, this table manufactured, cleared by the CAA because it was all the rest of it. So anyway, off we went and it was great, 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 great fun. He nearly killed me actually by, he was accidentally standing on my oxygen in the basket and I started to turn blue and he realized he was standing on my oxygen. So eventually uh, the two guys uh, uh, abseiled out of the basket onto the, onto the table and they did, they, they had a full meal. They, there was no messing about, full meal. And then um, they said, right, we're, I said, look, don't both go off at once, do, do it slowly. So off they went. And then uh, I had to land this thing. And what was most dangerous when I was landing this thing, I landed and the basket was fine. But all of a sudden this table came crashing through. And thankfully I had a hard hat in the basket. Otherwise, um, that asparagus would have had its fun with me. <laughs> For the record, David, what was the menu? Well, I, I know they had asparagus. I know they had, I think it was salmon, uh, but it was all into little chunks. Uh, but it was very well thought out. And it was a great trip. Mum champagne gave us lots of champagne. And it, it, was, it was a really hugely enjoyable event. And again, Beer is a wonderful guy. Um, He's he's a great lad, and we had great fun. I have the honour of chairing the first ever literary festival event Bear ever did, being the first person to interview him for his first ever book, back at the Hay Festival in the early 2000s. And even then, you could see he was going somewhere. His heart was really in what he was doing. Nice guy, really nice guy. Right, let's come. We don't have much time, and I'm, I forgive the awful brevity of these things. It is the nature of a literary festival. We have to fit to time. But bring us up to date with the book we're really here to talk about, actually, which is Open Water Breaking Ice, the story of your involvement in the Polar Ocean Challenge. The polar bit I understand, but in previous to this, I was unaware of any interest you may have had in being on the water. Well, I've done, I, I would say I was a novice sailor and um, I've done a, a lot of sailing with other people. Uh, certainly down in Antarctica when I sailed from Hobart down to the South Magnetic Pole across the Southern Ocean. Um, and then I did another trip in Shackleton's footsteps going to South Georgia. So that Southern Ocean, <laughs> the good old ocean. Um, but no Brit had ever gone around uh, the poles. And in my time, going back from 83, um, to you know, current day, I've seen huge change in my lifetime in the Arctic Ocean. And when my girls were at school, you know, there was this old thing of well, what's the difference between global warming and climate change? And I thought, well, what would be nice is if we could do something um, and young people could log in, have a geography lesson, and also we could give them some actual hard facts, no, no politics or anything like that, um, no rah-rah, just actual politics. And that, that was the aim. Um, so I thought, well, let's, let's give this a go. Again, Paul Gorsland uh, invited me on one of his trips to go around. He did it in a very small little catamaran. I remember at the time saying, no, there's no way you're going to do that. And, uh, and he did it. It was, a, you know, really fantastic. So I thought, okay, um, I'm going to do it. So I got a team together and the important thing was getting the right boat, which I got from, in the end, the Irish. And they took nearly, uh, I think, five years to do the same thing. And I needed a Russian skipper, which would help with a permit, um, a Russian speaker to talk to 
um, the Russians on a daily basis. So that that those are a couple of key things that I I got. And when I the, the skipper Nikolai, um, I was introduced to him in Moscow. I went out and we had breakfast, and I said, "Well, this is what I like to do." He he'd already done this before northeast and northwest, but again. He did it over four different seasons. And he said, there's no way you're gonna do it in one season. So I sort of gave him some vodka at uh, breakfast. And um, he said, well, and after you know, a bottle of vodka, he said, well, maybe, you know, uh, maybe we could try this. So uh, that, that really was the plan. So as you know, set off from uh, Mamansk. This was, a, this, it was, it was awkward for me slightly because this particular year, I was the high sheriff of Wiltshire, so I couldn't actually um, do the whole thing and couldn't spend a lot of time away. And so I picked up the boat in Mamansk and got off again in Greenland. But uh, Ben Edwards, who was 14 years old then, um, he, he did the whole thing from Bristol to Bristol. And I thought it was also very important to get a young person on the trip because he could and he did uh, get on social media quite a lot because it was more important that a young person could talk a young person's language than some old fart trying to get the message across. So that, it, it, I mean, um, you know, the gods were looking down on us. We, we only just got through with about, uh, in, it, I'd say it was hours, at the most one day's uh, grace because after, it all um, closed in behind us. So we were extraordinarily lucky. David, you very kindly offered to read uh, one of the blog extracts uh, from the 28th of August, 2016, um, far away. Okay, so as you said, 28th of August, 2016. So the last couple of days in the Chukchi Sea, in a rolling sea, it's difficult to stay in your bunk, let alone sleep. So everyone is a little grouchy. So what is this like? Well, how do you do your number ones in such a sea state at rolling waves and 25 knot winds? Well, our toilet, which is the heads, have a little bowl with a hand pump. Ladies, it's easy. They just sit. While the boys, it's a lot harder. Firstly, you have to find your John Thomas through several layers and get him out. Meanwhile, because of the pitching and the rolling, you have to stand 45 degrees to the bowl and hope the toilet seat doesn't chop your crown jewels off. Number twos, oh my goodness, you have to plan for this one. Firstly, hold on to the wall handle or the boat, or you're a goner. Sit down and try and do your business, holding on to the wall handle for dear life. Don't let go. With your other hand, find the paper. Two sheets rationed only. Holding on to the wall handle, tear off two sheets with your teeth. With your other hand, try and wipe your delicate bottom. And then try and pump the handle to get rid of your breakfast. To put this into context, it's like riding a bucking bronco whilst trying to do the essentials. Our heads have a flimsy plywood door. More than once, I've headbutted that door while sitting on the throne. Actually, it's pretty quite dangerous. I wonder if we did a risk assessment for that one. <laughs> Thank you, David. The one thing that everybody loves about adventures is how do you do the day-to-day -day quotidian things that we all don't think about. Can I point out the blindingly obvious to you, which is it is equally possible when a bloke needs to pee just to drop your jaws and sit down like a girl and a lot safer in a rocking boat than trying to stand up. I don't know why more men don't think of this. You're quite right. And uh, uh, because, you know, we did the blog that went out, there must have been every sailor in the entire world who got onto me and said, sit down, otherwise you're going to exactly. kill yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to be amongst them. I'm happy to be amongst them. David, there's one last thing I want to talk to you about. I am obviously cognizant these days that what people are seeing on screen is two aging, stale, pale males. And because I made it my mission during the course of this festival 
to try to show to the younger generations beneath us, specifically women, that they can do this too. And they should if they want to. I've just been talking earlier on today with uh, Marianne Ohota, talking about young women becoming archaeologists, young women becoming anthropologists and furthering that science. Can we talk about how you have inspired your daughters, Alicia, Camilla and Amelia, and the challenges they have met, um, which have been no, you know, no mean feats, how you have inspired the women in your family? I'm not too sure if I've uh, inspired them. Uh, I, I did the Duke of Edinburgh's award, as I said earlier, and I'm, I, it's a voluntary thing, uh, but I actually made my girls uh, do it. And they, all three of them, did the bronze, silver and gold, and then they all did Outward Bound as well. And during summer holidays, we'd go off uh, walking. Um, they'd always like the beach, of course, so it'd be always nice if we could do a mountain and then the beach to finish off. Uh, but it was interesting, you know, my eldest and my youngest were quite easy to get through. My middle one, I had to bribe her and cajole her. <laughs> uh, and it was, uh, she finished it in the end. And interestingly, as she got older, she's the one who's talked about it the most. Um, but during you know, their growing up, my, uh, my, my eldest daughter, Alicia, she was 15 when she crossed Baffin by, um, in winter uh, with a very small group. I think she was the youngest to do that. And then my middle daughter, Camilla, when she was 15, she skied to the North Pole with me, which was, uh, I think it was two degrees that we did. And then my youngest daughter, then uh, Amelia, when she was 15, she did um, the last uh, nearly two degrees to the South Pole, and she was the youngest person. But I've got this theory, you know, being a father with three daughters, uh, what I found is they listen to you up to about the age of 15. Once it's once they're 16 and they got their own mind, forget it. There's no way they're going to listen to you. So that's why I <laughs> that's why I I got them doing all these things at that age. But what, notwithstanding... I think that's true of children of any gender, David. Yeah. If you haven't gotten them by 15, you've lost them forever. Yeah. And the nice thing, they've all gone on and carried on doing their own thing. So Alicia's carried on. She's a balloon pilot, very good balloon pilot, much better pilot than myself, actually. And she um, did a couple of world records last year. Uh, Camilla's gone on and done some Arctic stuff and Amelia the same. So I think it's slightly in the blood. And I think they're slightly smarter than me and, uh, you know, they, they do it, you know, the right way. I, I sort of tend to uh, kick the tires and light the fires and off. They, they think about it and then they do it properly. But going back to your initial point of getting young people and young girls involved, throughout my life, I found young girls are far, far more capable uh, than young boys. Boys, you know, they can be hard work at that age, and we both know because we were that age a long time ago. Girls, they, you know, and it's noticeable, you know, down in the south, and they, all the staff down there will tell you, females look after themselves so much better. Boys get, and men, get frostbite, they get frostbite on their face, they, they don't quite know, it's a bit macho. Uh, to come back with something missing whereas girls really listen you tell them once and they listen and do it uh boys you know they need a kick up the arse sometimes exactly exactly final question for me um it's really to give you an opportunity to speak directly to the edward stanford travel writers festival audience in the days of global warming when we are have to be responsible as to how we travel, how we holiday, how we visit a place. What words of counsel would you give people who are hankering to either get on a boat, get on a plane, but go somewhere other? I think, you know, do it, but be, be conscious of it. Um, wherever I go, I try to minimise my carbon footprint. I try to offset the carbon footprint. And, uh, you know, when I go to a school and a little boy says, well, what, you know, how can I do anything? And I, I said, well, I actually turn off the lights. I, I turn off all the electric. 
And it might not mean much, but if we all did it, you know, we're going to make a conscious decision. And uh, and it's just it's just we've got we've got one planet. We're only here once. Clean up after yourself. It, it absolutely. I know this has got nothing to do with climate change, but it infuriates me when you get garbage people throwing stuff out of the the car windows and destroying our nature that we we live in. I just can't understand it. And you know, just be enjoy the world, but be conscious and try and do everything you can to offset uh, any of the uh, the travel that you do. David, thank you so much. There's so much else I'd like to have talked to you about, not least being the first member of the first British team to win the Gordon Bennett Cup in 102 years. We'll have you back on again. I'll see if I can I can twist the arm of an organiser and we'll have you back, hopefully, on a stage, you and I, in conversation, in Olympia, at the Edward Stanford next year. So, David, thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you so much for your generous answers. David Hempelman Adams, thank you so much for joining us at the Edward Stanford Travel Writing Festival 2021. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Well, I think after a bottle of vodka, I'd be prepared to captain a boat. Thank you, David and Paul, for that invigorating and inspiring event. So, turn off the lights, turn off the electric, but not before you've got hold of a copy of both David's books. No Such Thing as Failure and Open Water Breaking Ice, which are available to buy at stanfords.co.uk.